Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last of this season's Art in Focus lectures, co-sponsored by Stony Brook University Libraries. I'm Helen Harrison, director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, and I want to thank Chris Kretz, the library's head of academic engagement, for his help in organizing this series, which is supported by Stony Brook's John H. Marburger III Fund. Today, Prudence Pfeiffer is going to take us downtown to Coenty Slip now a landlocked public park and pedestrian walkway with a nice view of the water. In the 1950s, it was a ramshackle relic of New York City's maritime heyday, lined with former sailors, sailmakers' lofts, warehouses, bars, and the Siemens Church Institute. Its spacious quarters and cheap rents attracted a group of artists whose arrivals and departures frame Prudence's captivating portrait of the neighborhood's brief life as a bohemian enclave. Prudence, an art historian, writer, and editor specializing in modern and contemporary art, is managing editor of the creative team at the Museum of Modern Art, New York. She received her PhD from Harvard University. Following a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University, she was a senior editor at Art Forum magazine from 2012 to 2017 and digital content director at David Zwerner in 2018. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, New York Review of Books, Art Forum, and Book Forum, among other publications, and The Slip, her first book, published in August by Harper, and here it is, was long listed for the National Book Award. So everyone, please stay muted and hold your questions until after Prudence's talk, or put them in the chat, and I'll read them during the Q&A. And now I'll turn it over to Prudence. Thank you so much, Helen. I am just going to share my screen. I'm really delighted to be a part of this illustrious series at the Paula Krasner House. And thank you all for Zooming in with me this evening. Um, as some of you may know, I grew up in Southampton, attended Southampton High. So I feel a real affinity and connection with the Paula Krasner House where I've made frequent pilgrimages. Uh, along with Willem de Kooning Studio and Green River Cemetery, among many other special spots on the East End. Um, I wrote a lot of the slip in Southampton and conducted interviews with Jack Youngerman in Bridgehampton over three years, as well as um, visiting James Rosenquist's former home and studio in Springs to interview Mary Lou Adams for this book. And um, Ellsworth Kelly even spent several summers out East during his time living at Coenties Slip, although he would in the end move upstate where I think there was also less of a looming legacy of abstract expressionism. Um, but here he is during a very prolific summer of 1960 in East Hampton. One of the things that tonight's talk will focus on in honor of its host is the relationship of the artists who lived on the slip to their abstract expressionist forebears, one of many threads in my book. But I want to start, though, by just setting a little bit of the scene around what and where Coenty Slip was, since place is such a crucial part of this story. And one of the more fascinating aspects of writing this book and getting to share it with audiences um, is the number of people who have come up to me and said, you know, I've lived in New York my whole life. I've never heard of Coenty's Slip, um, let alone knew about its long history or how that found its way into so much artwork. So um, what is a slip? In nautical terms, a slip is a ramp or water space between piers for landing or repairing boats. It's a mooring, but not a permanent home, a metaphor that runs through the book as the artists living on Coenty's Slip were there for less than a decade and some for just a few years. And here is a very early map of the city's southeastern edge in a kind of uh, clockwise turned orientation. And you can see right there in the middle, um, Coenty's Slip. So starting in the first quarter of the 17th century, a dozen of these slips ran up the southeastern edge of Manhattan. They're among the first and most crucial engineering projects of the settlement. Um, and Quenty Slip is bounded to the north by north to northwest by Pearl, the oldest street in Manhattan, and led out like a widening funnel or bell to the East River, passing Water Street, Front Street, and South Street along the way. And these street titles tell the story of creeping coastline development as each used to be at the river's edge. 
Kaweni Slip is most certainly named after early Dutch colonial settlers, Conrad and Anetje ten Eyck. The area of the slip where they lived became known as Coenche, a kind of contraction of Conrad and Anetje. And I really, have, as I've mentioned before, I've liked this idea that the place name also carries the woman's name in it, which is pretty unusual parody um, for that time. Willem de Kooning actually told Jack Youngerman that it should be pronounced Kuntis, but Coentis has stuck with us and perhaps allows a little more for that contraction of two people as well. And here is another map from 1849. You can see over sort of towards the left of the map, Coenti Slip is one of the deepest slips. It's slicing in all the way to the boundary of Front Street, whereas the surrounding slips and piers go only as far in as South Street. So it's truly both a waterway and a street and only a, a few blocks long, as Helen mentioned. By the time of the late 19th century, in this map, you can see that the waterway portion of the slip has been filled in. So if you kind of start in the very far left and move in just about two streets, you can see that is the Coentis slip there. Um, it's filled in in part because of drunk people um, who kept falling into the water at night and it's made into a little park. And you can also just see the curving ladder line for the L train, which started running in 18. 1875, 30 feet up, sneaking its way through the slip. The elevated train took a famous turn through Quenti Slip, where for a moment it looked like you might run into the sea before it veered right again. The L stopped running in 1942, but its steel armature wasn't fully dismantled until the following decade. And not surprisingly, as you can see from this newspaper article on the right, there were lots of crashes. Um, and you can see the L referenced in Stuart Davis's Amazing House and Street from 1931. This is part of the Whitney's collection, which depicts the intersection of Front Street on the left of the painting and Coenti Slip. The slip in Davis's painting is a series of lower brick warehouses. Bright blue triangles against a green column suggest the elevated train tracks. And taller buildings even then rising behind the 19th century buildings are made from patterned lines, stripes and grids, not unlike samples of the work to come at the slip by Ellsworth Kelly, Agnes Martin, and Lenora Tawney. And here's a Google map aerial view of Coenti Slip today. You can see the red um, little you are here mark is at 35 Coenti Slip. Just again to set the scene of this place and the persistence of travel of arrivals and departures by sea, by land, by air. You can see out on Pier 6 um, in front of Coenti Slip is um, a helicopter pad. And that actually um, was first uh, founded in 1960 during the time that the artists were there. And Robert Indiana often comments on the noise of helicopters coming and going um, in his journal. So Quenny Slip was once the center of trade for the growing metropolis, a place where the sheer volume of goods loaded and unloaded from ships and warehouses was staggering. One journalist walking down Quenty Slip in 1879 recorded streets clogged with wagons and horses hauling bales of cotton, hogshead of tobacco, barrels of flour, sugar, loads of oranges, boxes of tea, four bushel bags of peanuts, cases of silk and Indian shawls, a steam boiler, and coops of geese. Kaweni Slip was not just a ro row of sailmaking lofts. Every building had multiple trades stacked by floor, a snapshot of burgeoning American capitalism and speculation. On the ground level were grocers, dry good merchants, earthenware dealers, saloons, weighers, measurers, hiring halls, ship stores, and chandlery. And then on the upper floors, iron dealers, tobo proprietors, accounting and clerks, and warehouses. And here is a beautiful photograph of the slip on a slushy winter day in 1893 by Alfred Stieglitz. The broad prows of the great ships cut over the street like a canopy of branches to the street lamp, which itself resembles a mast. The sidewalk below signs for sail lofts and sail makers and paint shops is crowded with overcoated men and South Street is clogged with horses and carriages and a lone man shoveling dirty snow. This is when South Street was known as Strito Ships and the neighborhood as Sailor Town, when on any given day, 2,000 sailors embarked from ships berthed in the slips. But 
By the time the artists arrived at the slip, it was already a place of waning industry and relative obscurity, described in many accounts of the time as a desolate desert after 5 p.m. and on the weekends. Here, captured on the roof of one of the buildings on the slip by the great photographer Hans Namath in 1958, are some of the central characters of our story. The French actress Delphine Serig, perched on the wreck of Adirondack chairs, her toddler son Duncan Youngerman, next to Robert Indiana, who was then still known as Robert Clark. He hadn't changed his name yet and sort of become the artist, Robert Indiana. Just behind him, the artist Ellsworth Kelly, then Jack Youngerman, the artist married to Serig, and Agnes Martin, always in sensible shoes. And also not to be forgotten is Orange, Sarig and Youngerman's dog, or Lorange, as Sari carefully call, playfully called her, found on the street and an important connecting force between the artists and others in the neighborhood. And not pictured, but a part of this core group, Lenore Tawney, shown here in her Coenti Slip studio, and James Rosenquist standing just outside of his Coenti Slip loft. Less than a decade earlier, of course, Hans Namath had helped launch the mythic reception of abstract expressionism, photographing and filming Jackson Pollock's balletic paint flinging at Pollock and Lee Krasner's studio home on the east end of Long Island. Now he was photographing the group at Coenti Slip for the next chapter of American art. But if you were to stumble on Namath's Ruth photo without knowing about this short-lived community in New York in the 50s and 60s, you might be surprised to see such different artists together in a single image. Each would go on to have a crucial impact, whether seismic or subtle, on 20th century art, even if their work was often difficult to fit into any one movement and its reach not always equal. These artists never formed a group or a movement or school. They worked in very different media, abstract and representative painting, drawing and sculpture and assemblage and textile works, theater and film. It's a group brought together not by the tenets of composition or technique or even philosophy, as with abstract expressionism, or by a particular way of reacting to or synthesizing the cultural moment, as with pop art. Instead, this setting fostered what I call collective solitude, a model of creativity that is about being together in a very specific place at a very specific time without denaturing each individual locked away story. To focus on place is to write a different history of art, one that can be maybe more inclusive, more open to serendipitous interaction, and one that can explain more of the cultural, emotional, and financial context behind any art object. To bring in the small details around the conditions and materials of working that help uncover why anything even gets made at all. Their time at the slip helped them find themselves as artists and provided literal material for their work salvaged from the wreckage of all the demolition going on around them as the last vestiges of an older moment in the city made way for skyscrapers. And though they swapped materials and spaces and stopped doing one thing or started doing another because of what they saw in each other's lofts, though they became lovers and broke up, they could retreat to the solitary work and discipline of art making without any need for explanation or excuse. For a brief moment, the slip was a home for artists who had been at sea. What if, rather than technique or style, it's a spirit of place that defines a crucial moment for a group of artists? All of the artists who settled at the slip came from outside of New York City. Ellsworth Kelly and Jack Youngerman met in Paris just after World War II at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and Youngerman and Delphine Serig met on the streets of Paris and quickly fell in love. They were married after dating for three months. Kelly and Youngerman were both on the GI Bill in a city that was shattered by World War II. Paris had been the seat of refined culture since its 17th century academies and salons defined fine art and the tenets of history painting and had been the center of modernism since the middle of 19th century's breakthroughs in vision and representation. At the end of the war, there was a certain level of shame at the Nazis' brazen occupation of one of democracy's symbolic centers of culture the existence of the cooperating Vichy government, and now the American bailout in the form of the Marshall Plan. So Youngerman arrives in Paris in the middle of a beautiful fall day in October 1947 as, in his own words, quote, a skinny country boy from Kentucky. And he meets Kelly at the Ecole. 
Kelly, seen here, had been in Europe during the war as part of the secret Ghost Army 603rd Engineers Camouflage Battalion, helping to create fake army props, including airfields and inflatable trucks and tanks to confuse the German troops during D-Day operations. And that is a whole other fascinating story we cannot get into tonight. But he chooses to go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the GI Bill because, as he said, they didn't care about attendance. He came to France with a notebook already full of pages and pages of artworks and buildings and museums to visit. And you see this notebook here uh, in the central image. And it's a little bit hard to see, but there are little sort of pencil checks where he went back into the notebook after visiting these places and checked off um, where he knew he wanted to see. And there's pages of all the different cities and um, places where he visited. In Paris, Kelly and Youngerman could avoid the debates and macho posturing around abstract expressionism, then overtaking post-war New York. A major spread on Jackson Pollock in Life magazine in August 1949 asked, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? The 37-year-old Pollock, arms crossed and leaning against a painting, reluctantly takes on the question's challenge. And this is a story that has been long rehearsed, particularly, I'm sure, with art historians here at the Pollock Krasner House, so I won't dwell on it too much. But Pollock's origins in American regionalism and the intensity of Thomas Hart Benton and Jose Clemente Orozco, with the idea of being literally in the painting and Mark Rothko's assertion that painting had to do with a certain release of control, with the championing of the incredibly influential critic and thinker Clement Greenberg, all introduced a new assurance in an American painting outside of the histories of European modernism. Youngerman and Kelly pored over the Pollock Life article at a Paris cafe. They were impressed with Pollock, but felt that the scene in New York was very far away. They had no real contact with it or with what artists were doing there. And here on the right, you see one of Kelly's quick line sketches of Youngerman from Paris. Both Youngerman and Kelly were already seeking an economy of means a reduction to the simplest expression of abstraction that seemed in direct opposition to abstract expressionist painting and ethos. For younger men, shape would become central to his ideas around composing a painting, the very thing that Pollock's abstractions eradicated or took to its most extreme form in his tangled lines. And for Kelly, the way that he was beginning to find subjects for his abstract paintings in Paris, a mining of the environment that would accelerate once he moved to New York City and Coenty Slip, was about carefully translating a compositional plan and color from his observations. I have to figure it all out beforehand. It's not finding the painting by doing it the way, say, de Kooning or Pollock worked. And on the left, you see here Jack Youngerman's Untitled Oil on Paper from 1953. And on the right is Ellsworth Kelly's Ink on Paper drawing from 1950 titled Light Reflection on Water. At the same time, the contemporary scene in Paris was not offering any real insights for Kelly and Youngerman. They had amazing history lessons there and got to meet so many established artists in their studios, Giacometti, Brancusi, Arp, but they did not see a way forward for their work in France either. And then Kelly sees a reproduction of a painting from Ad Reinhardt's exhibition at Betty Parsons Gallery in the December 1953 issue of Art News that he finds at a bookstore. And it makes him think that maybe, just maybe, he could find some compatriots in New York after all. So Kelly heads back to the States in June, 1954. Youngerman writes him in 1955 from Paris, painting in Paris is dead and he, dead is in all caps. And then as a kind of wistful postscript, is there any American painting? Encouraged by Kelly, Youngerman and Sarig would soon be on a boat to New York with their six month old Duncan in December of 1956. Now, there's another crucial moment of overlap, or you could say adjacency, between the Abex crew and the artists who settled at Coenty Slip, and that's in the figure of Betty Parsons. Parsons had opened her gallery in New York in September of 1946, inheriting many of Peggy Guggenheim's artists, including Pollock, Rothko, Barnett Newman, and Clifford Still, as well as Ad Reinhardt, who was such a crucial figure for Kelly, as I've already mentioned. I don't have time to get into too much here about Parsons, um, which I do go into a little bit more in the slip. She's a truly colorful and incredible figure in post-war American art. Uh, but when her Abex giants, as she called them, uh, defected to rival dealer Sidney Janis, it opened up a space for Parsons to consider other artists. She'd visited Kelly and Youngerman in Paris, and she soon began showing them in New York. 
She would also encourage Agnes Martin to move to New York from New Mexico, introduced her to Barnett Newman, who became an important champion of her work and a constant presence in her studio, as well as Ellsworth Kelly, and Parsons then showed Martin's work too. So this ragtag group of artists all starting out in their careers, despite ranging in age from 24 to 50, all end up in cheap, illegal maritime buildings and former sailmaking lofts on one of the most obscure streets in New York City. And I'm showing here a very tongue in cheek, quote, outlandish guide for in tourists that ran an Esquire magazine in 1960. And I know it's very small on the screen. I've put sort of little red arrows, but Quenny Slip is listed as one of the 10 most in places to live because it is so obscure. But the reality was that, quote, there's a kind of end of the world feeling about Quenny Slip, as Youngerman said, speaking about how the artists living there had little desire to go back into the city. The idea of going back to the city, despite that Quenny Slip was very much in Manhattan, as hopefully we've established here, suggests just how separate a realm the neighborhood represented for the artists. One of the things we were very conscious of, as Youngerman put it, was the fact that we all knew we weren't part of the de Kooning Pollock legacy in art, which was centered around 10th Street. Even in the late 1950s, abstract expressionism and its second generation were still the reigning idea. For Youngerman, this was the first time that American art had made an impact beyond the local, and this colored the air. And yet for these artists, Coenty Slip was completely apart from the New York art scene. Now, since it was dug and shaped, Coenty Slip was always a place apart. That's the story of its geography and history. At the threshold of land and sea, it harbored a unique microcosm of labor, perpetually home to hybrid communities that were deeply anchored to it and also transient. In other words, these artists were far from the first. One of the most distinct of these communities was the New York City Canal Boaters. And here's a Harper's Weekly illustration from 1884 of the canal boat colony on Coenty Slip. The canalers and their families lived on their boats most months of the year, traveling more than 500 miles down river from Buffalo to New York with cargo of wheat. The slip became the center of flower trade in New York and the community at the end of it was known as Canal Boat Village but they were also constantly facing threats of eviction through the closing of waterways and shutting down of mooring rights at the slip. And articles always pointed out the separateness of the canaler. Here's one quote from one such feature in the New York Times. No city man nor country man, nor yet a follower of wind and current, but a being unto himself. He is as special as a merman. Or the other con contingent community of the slip, sailors, who found harbor on shore leave, a place to stay and an escape from creditor sharks at the Siemens Church Institute. Established, this building established in 1913 at the end of the slip. It was a hotel that slept just under 600 men, but also served as a place to get a hot meal, take a hot shower and receive mail. And a place where the artists of the slip also went for hot meals and showers. So just to look at a few other contingent forms of labor, one being the acting life of Delphine Sereg. For Sereg, much of her time on the slip was spent waiting. In letters home to Paris and Beirut, she describes the difficulties of balancing life as an actor and young mother, the countless auditions she went on, the short runs of off-off Broadway shows in Connecticut or Boston. It felt liberating to be alone in a hotel room, prepping to become someone else on stage. She was grateful for the acting life, in which such a separation from her regular routine, the suspension before returning to the world had a time limit. Sarig realized that part of her talent was that she could easily slip into another life and then out of again, out of it again. Um, her story is whoops, quite hmm, interesting. Not sure sure why that's not coming up. Her story is um, quite amazing and I don't really have time to get into it here, but two film projects related to the slip were among the most anomalous um, that happened on the slip. She ended up starring in Robert Frank and Alfred Leslie, Leslie's Pull My Daisy, what became the quintessential cult beat classic narrated by Jack Kerouac and with Allen Ginsberg among many other poets uh, and beat characters um, starring in it. And after the French, and after the French director Alain René visited her on the slip, 
she ended up leaving New York to return to France and star in Renee's last year in Marienbad in 1961, which la launched her as an international film star. And there's still other stories of labor here, Jack Youngerman and Robert Indiana's short-lived teaching endeavor, the Coenti Slip Workshop. And you see the front cover of the brochure they designed for it. The idea was to earn some cash, inviting amateur artists to take art classes at the slip. But after just a few months, it limped to a close. There were several logistical reasons for this. It was too out of the way, the space was too cold. While the artists dealt as best they could with their own drafty lofts in the winter, often collecting old wooden pallets from the Fulton fish market to burn in their stoves, somewhat aromatic as the artist Ann Wilson put it, it was too much for the workshop attendees. But in many ways, the workshop was set up to fail because the artists' hearts were never in it. The slip was their private place, a refuge from the very city the workshop invited in. As Agnes Martin put it, when you paint, you don't have time to get involved with people. And that's what's so wonderful about the slip. We all respect each other's need to work. For Agnes Martin, the slip offered a particular geographic isolation that was really necessary for her to work away from interruptions as an artist who suffered from schizophrenia and strove for what she called, quote, the perfection that transcends what you see. And here she is in her quilted work suit, practical again, considering the lack of heating in the slip lofts. It was at the slip where she really got to work. I just painted and threw them away and painted and threw them away. And one of the first works that she made and liked at the slip was Harbor Number no. One from 1957, which you see here on the right which was significant to her because it symbolized, quote, a safe place. And it's also important to point out that while in the early half of the 20th century, women enjoyed a brief stint of liberation, encouraged by gaining the right to vote, the rise of industrial jobs that required their skills, and the exodus of so many younger men from the workforce during World War II, by the 1950s, it was considered highly unusual for a woman to live alone and inappropriate outside of separate hotels and buildings designated women only. In a period in New York that also saw the harshest crackdown on homosexuality and a retrenched stigma against living alone, unmarried, after decades of progress, the slip was something else entirely, a safe harbor for its predominantly gay artists. During the period that the artists lived on the slip, homosexual behavior was defined as a crime. A raid in the winter of 1959 shut down gay bars across Manhattan and Brooklyn. And leading up to the 1964 World's Fair, police launched major raids on gay activities and spots around New York City. As late as December 1963, the New York Times ran a lengthy front page article with the headline, Growth of Overt Homosexuality in City Provokes Wide Concern. So a neighborhood like the Slip on the outskirts of the city and so off the radar as to not even be mentioned in this article as a center for artistic activity could offer a certain freedom for queer artists to live as they pleased. It provided a release from societal expectations, but also community. The Slip also provided literal material for the artists, much of it related to its deep maritime history and the intense demolition going on around New York City particularly downtown during this period. And the research nerd in me was so excited to find this receipt on the left um, at the Ellsworth Kelly archives. And when I go to archives, I always say, I wanna see everything, even the receipts, and this is why. Um, here we see in one of his last months at the slip that Kelly bought yards of canvas from a maritime hardware and sailmaker company on Chamber Street, bringing his supplies back to paint on in a loft where once such canvas was used to sew sails. And on the right, you see one of Kelly's many sketchbook journals from his time at Coenti Slip, where he writes of all the noise from the river, heavy rainstorms when he had to go up to sweep the roof, but his ceiling still kept leaking. These pragmat pragmatic notes written amid wonderful sketches of paintings he's working on, whose forms and shapes were taken from encounters with his environment. Lenore Tawney would hang her woven forms from the tall rafters of her former sailmaking loft or onto the hoist, and she would finish the ends of her work with sailor knots as just outside her window, tugboats with the same knots drifted by. And oops, here on the right from one of her journals from her time at the slip, Tawney made several drawings of the view from the Staten Island Ferry looking back to the Manhattan skyline. 
You can see birds swooping through the churn of the ferry's wake that seems to tumble down from the cityscape in dark tangled lines, not unlike the cascading currents of her woven forms. And this on the left is her work Vespers from 1961, which Tawny is working on in her loft. She also used water metaphors to describe her working method. In one ecstatic weaving se session, she wrote that her work poured out like a fountain or a river. The river was right out my window and I looked at it every day. During this period, she and Martin both made major works titled Dark River. This, is, this photo on the left is one of my favorite finds from my research. This is Ellsworth Kelly up on the roof of Coenti Slip in 1957. One of the first things that Kelly did when he moved into the slip was start a small flower and vegetable garden on the roof, complete with corn. And it's at the slip where he really took up his daily practice of plant drawings begun earlier in Paris. His studio would soon be filled with his elegant sketches of plants. And though audiences today are very familiar of this incredible part of his oeuvre, it wasn't so well known at the time. The first drawings weren't exhibited in New York until 1969, and these plant drawings were really best known only among his friends. They breathed oxygen into his abstract paintings. It's not just that nature provided subjects for Kelly that were already made, or that his drawings allowed him to think through forms in a way that instructed all of his paintings. He saw nature itself as the ultimate artist, I want to work like nature works, Kelly said, as if channeling the poet John Keats. I want to paint in a way that trees grow, leaves come out, how things happen. Indiana was among the most resourceful, tearing down loft walls made from cheap homosote particle board to use as the structure of the work, as in his The Slips on the far left here from 1959-60 hauling found pieces of wood and old wheels, gear shifts, and stencils from the demolition of maritime in industry buildings back to his loft to create assemblages and sculptures. And here in the middle, we see his marine works from 1962, made from a 19th century loading ramp he found at the slip and named after the ship Chandley shop that used to be his studio. And in this photo from the, his Coenti Slip Studio, you can see him sitting amid some of the treasures salvaged from the buildings around the slip. Now, because this, um, we're focusing in this talk particularly on how the artists of Coenti Slip took on or swerved from their abex forebears, and my book tries to complicate any easy linear trajectory, but I did want to point out a very important exhibition of Barnett Newman's work in 1959 at French & Co curated by none other than Clement Greenberg, that showed a lot of Newman's early work from 1946 to 1948, 52 rather. And here on the right, we see Barnett Newman's major breakthrough, One Mint One from 1948. And this is the first time that he used the vertical zip in his composition. Indiana visited the show and he was actually personally guided around the exhibit by Newman himself, who was there that day. And in um, Indiana's The Slips, he experiments with using the natural line down the length of the board to set up a tension, quote, not yet seen in my work. So he makes his own kind of Newman zip. Even if ultimately it would be the incorporation of words and text into his paintings and sculptures that became the biggest breakthrough for Indiana. And that has everything to do with his time on Coenti's Slip. The incorporation of text was inspired in part by his brief affair with Ellsworth Kelly, who became an important catalyst for Indiana's art, as well as with the environment of the slip and the building that Indiana lived in. Indiana used to joke that he lived in an Indiana, and you can see here on the right what he meant in terms of the kind of words that were painted on the outside of his studio. He also said that with Ellsworth, my whole life perspective changed. I could feel that something was going to happen shortly and it was just like going through a revolving door from night into day. The period that the artists were on the slip was a period of experimentation, of failure, of mistakes and false starts, just as much as it was one of breakthroughs and some of the most beloved and crucial works of American art. So how do we tell that story when typically there are a few objects or artifact, artifacts that trace such moments? Martin, for instance, destroyed many of her early assemblages and paintings made on the slip. It's only because of Tawny that some still exist as she collected them with the excuse of helping financially support Martin. And sometimes the only trace 
of what something once was is in passing notes in a journal, especially as supplies were so precious and paintings that didn't work out were quickly painted over. So here is a page on the left from Indiana's journal uh, where he's writing about an early work he made that was more abstract called Agadir, which ultimately he felt was too close to his neighbors, Agnes Martin and Ellsworth Kelly's approaches. And you can see how he ends up reworking it to become the American Dream One from 1961. And this is a painting that left Alfred Barr quote unquote spellbound. He immediately purchased it for MoMA's collection. It was a huge moment for Indiana who at the time didn't even have a gallery. And just to say, Indiana's excitement about this work entering MoMA's collection is very evident from the museum questionnaire that he filled out for it. He does not play it cool. Um, he writes really wonderful, but very loquacious responses to all of the questions in bright red ink. So much so that Barr, when he first met Indiana, compliments him on his questionnaire, saying it, calling it as much a masterpiece as Indiana's painting. So Indiana's painting is about missteps in the American dream. He called this painting cynical, coming out of his childhood in the depression when life was so mean and his father, who left his family to travel to California on Route 66, was full of dreams and promises for the big house on the hill, which never materialized. And Indiana, in fact, moved more than 20 times in his childhood. To seek a definition of the American dream is to seek what the country stands for since its founding. But really, it was a modern invention that was used to argue for isolationism in Woodrow Wilson's neutrality stance during World War II, but also for immigrant hope, to de a description of the archetypal experience that gave everyone a chance in their new country. It was tied to both racist policies and racial justice, the idea of class equity associated with socialist values and the personal wealth associated with capitalism. For his own take on the American dream, Indiana includes signs of transience passing through gambling and luck, highways, pinball machines, and roadside bars. The jukebox America he painted in the American Dream One could also be as much about the dream of openly going out and dancing in a bar in New York as it is about a kind of Midwestern status quo. And here is James Rosenquist, president-elect, which he began working on in the late fall of 1960 at Coenty Slip, painting on the back of thin masonite panels that he'd recycled from his job as a billboard painter. They barely fit into his studio, scraping the tin ceiling. Rosenquist painted the smiling head of the politician John F. Kennedy, just elected, about to be sworn in as the first president born in the 20th century and the youngest in history, offering the United States a new frontier stretching all the way to the moon. Kennedy's face, bigger than a door and with teeth the size of toasters, seems to be taped with paint strokes to an image of manicured hands breaking apart a layered slice of moist cake and the side of a gleaming auto in the far right panel. Every ad and every magazine and TV commercial was telling you that you could buy happiness on the installment plan, as Rosenquist said. As he was working, he placed the panel with Kennedy's face in the window of his slip loft so that anyone looking up might see the incoming president smiling blankly out in the middle of a row of warehouse lofts at the edge of the river. The critic Gene Swenson, who was already making a name for himself as an important interlocutor for what would come to be known as American pop art, was at a loss for words when he first saw Rosenquist's paintings. He stayed at the slip for several hours despite the cold. He remembered Rosenquist jumping up and down as he talked, perhaps less out of animation than to keep himself warm. Swenson worried the tall artist might hit the low ceiling, a worry exacerbated by the scale of the paintings, so that, quote, at any minute I expected either the roof slowly to begin rising or the walls to move in, storybook fashion. Rosenquist offered him a swig of rot gut rum, but Swenson tried to keep warm instead by taking copious notes. He left the visit, quote, bewildered and quite upset, in his own words. The paintings temporarily defeated me, my training, and my aesthetic philosophy. And here we see Swenson echoing some of the ways in which Greenberg first wrote and talked about experiencing a Jackson Pollock painting. And I, I don't think it's an accident. Just a week before the assassination of President Kennedy, Rosenquist left Coenty Slip for Broom Street. In his new studio, right after Kennedy's death, Rosenquist pulled out his painting from a few years earlier that he had ostensibly finished at the Slip. We now know, thanks to the detective work of art historian Michael LaBelle, that he significantly reworked president-elect. The main area of his focus was Kennedy's face, which he repainted, 
perhaps remembering the day down at the slip in 1960 when he saw the presidential candidate drive by in a convertible, a strange cinematic overlap with his later death scene. So spoiler alert, um, part of the brevity of the artist's own time on Coenti's slip was because it was literally being brought down around them as the older lower profile of the city made way for new glass skyscrapers that were the emblematic of the new identity of downtown as a financial center. And there's a great irony that the architect of so much of this change, Robert Moses, was also the city official that, through his role as president of the 1964 World's Fair, also helped bring many of the artists on the slip to their broadest audience, displayed on the exterior of the New York Pavilion at the World's Fair. The artist's short decade on the slip is bracketed by a history of battling for preservation legislation in the state, with the Bard Act in 1959, 1955, which really interestingly argued for the importance of place, not just structure, as a trait to preserve. And then the Landmarks Law in 1965 approved just a few years too late to make a difference for the slip. A few years after the community of the slip was disbanded because its buildings were raised, the artist in residence zoning amendments made it possible for artists to live legally in commercial loft buildings in Soho and Tribeca. Part of the story of what slips away is that vernacular modest history of a city block, what Jane Jacobs wrote about in her incredible The Death and Life of Great American Cities in 1961 as the necessity for preserving old buildings, which allows for a diversity of industry and aesthetic styles through the quote, ingenious adaptations of old quarters to new uses. Jacobs' book came out after more than half of the buildings on Coenti Slip had already been raised. And soon after, Ada Louise Huxtable published a series of books on the architectural potpourri, her term of Manhattan under threat. And she literally walks down Coenti Slip to describe the importance of preserving not just the big civic monuments, but quote, these modest group groups of minor buildings that create the essence of a period and the spirit of the city. And here on the right, you see a demolition worker sitting on one of the great gargoyles that used to skirt the roof of the Siemens Church Institute, which was torn down in 1968. So on the left, we have, have Youngerman Kelly and Martin on that roof of 3-5 Coenti Slip with the East River behind them, and along with Robert Indiana, Delphine Serig, and toddler Duncan Youngerman having lunch in Kelly's loft. And here is Agnes Martin and Ellsworth Kelly in Kelly's loft. I just have to point out the amazing trapeze swing you see here. Um, there are some great anecdotes of mishaps from visiting guests who climbed on board it. Uh, Martin and Kelly were eating breakfast one morning when Kelly folded the lid of a round coffee can, cut it and set it back on the table where it gently moved, evolving a rocking, evoking a rocking horse. Martin suggested that he should make that and it became his first freestanding work, Pony. Another idle sketch that Kelly made at Martin's table on an envelope addressed to her became the formal basis of a sculpture gate. These moments with Martin in, the morning, in their morning ritual were for Kelly unconscious breaks, breakthroughs. And oops. here we have another swing occupied by Duncan Youngerman as Jack Youngerman works in his Quenty Slip studio on some studies for large paintings, studies he called seeds about to break open into the potentialities of shape. And on the right is a painting by Youngerman, Ram, 1959, made on the slip. This work was a departure for Youngerman, taking up some of the central colors of a small canvas that Kelly had made just a few, just a few years before for Robert Indiana, and which Indiana kept in his personal collection until his death. The MoMA curator Dorothy Miller on Kelly's urging came to visit Youngerman's studio in September, 1959. This was a quote, momentous visit, especially considering the out of the way place. Again, that's a quote from Youngerman and the rickety, rickety ladder that led to the top floor space where Youngerman worked, Miller was in heels. Her visit alone was an act of generosity as Youngerman put it. Miller took Ram back to MoMA and eight days later let Youngerman know that he was invited to exhibit six paintings in her upcoming exhibition, 16 Americans. As Youngerman joked, I was the last person chosen for this. I was the 16th American. Kelly was also in the show. And decades later, Kelly ended up buying Ram when it came up at auction in 1999. 
So 40 years after Kelly and Youngerman had exhibited together at MoMA in a show that was so central to both of their careers, Kelly donated the painting to MoMA. And Youngerman saw this as a hugely generous gift, a gesture to memorialize that crucial early time and place in both of their lives. There are a lot of stories like this at The Slip, particularly among Tawny and Martin. What are the bounds of a specific place and how does its history get into the work made there? Can certain places offer a unique kind of refuge to create, experiment, mess up, supported by people around you, but also always independent? I wanted to write an art history that acknowledges the parts of a place picked up and reworked, the ways that its own unique material history gets into the work in literal and less visible ways. And Coenti's slip really is a unique locus. A slip is place and displacement at the same time, something cut away then filled in by yet another material. The compression of focusing on a very short period and just three blocks of New York City actually brings us out into longer bands of history. Place quietly gives us a way to tell an art history that mentions how artists protected each other's space to work and spied on each other's progress how they paid their electric bills and illegally tapped into gas meters, how they scavenged materials for their artwork and how a column of wood taken from a demolished building and turned into a sculpture was itself once the mast of a ship. What they did when they were having a bad day or the equivalent of writer's block, the escape of taking the ferry or walking over the Brooklyn Bridge. A history that doesn't presuppose that artworks grow out of other artworks alone, or come fully formed into the world for us to experience them. For me, the story of this particular group of artists is a kind of modest generosity that's rarely noted in history's steady march of disruptive geniuses. And Wilson, one of those artists who lived briefly on the slip, was inspired by how her fellow artists there, quote, created a gestalt about the total commitment to the work and the life there. Call it commitment, call it love. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Prudence. I, I have to say I enjoyed the book enormously, uh, partly because I knew the area, but uh, like so many New Yorkers, I never knew that it was an artist enclave until I met Jack Youngerman, uh, who definitely remembered his time there so fondly. But I think it's so interesting the way some of the, the quotes you, you gave actually echo people like, for instance, Lee Krasner, who talked about how art should evolve naturally like a lettuce leaf. Mm. And so she also made that vegetal analogy that growing and, and evolving like nature was the ideal way for a work of art to progress without any kind of, um, almost without the artist's intervention that it should just happen in spite of them. Very, very nice uh, kind of meeting of the minds at that point. Um, now, let's see, does anyone have any questions? I do not see anything in the chat, uh, but if anyone would like to say anything or, or uh, you, you're welcome to unmute yourselves or if you have any questions. Wonderful presentation, but I must leave. <laughs> a window into something totally new to me. That's a nice comment from Leslie Flynn. Thank you so much for coming. And I see Susan Leventon has her hand up. Yeah, I'd like to say that I'm a docent at the Perez Art Museum and we have a docent book group and we read your book and we, we spent quite a few weeks on it because we did a few chapters at a time and found it so enormously fascinating. And our, we're all in awe of you. And the sense that we got of these artists made us appreciate them so much more and the combination of history and all that we learned about art was really profound. So thank you. Well, thank thank you so much. That's so sweet to say. And I, I actually recently gave a, a talk at the parish. I, I worked there um, in summers home from college and you know did did programs there when I was in high school. So I have such a fondness for the parish and that's really so lovely to to hear. Um, and I it's interesting, I, I just also heard from docents at the University of Virginia Art Museum um, who are who also read the book and it's such an I hadn't known of this um, you know activity of reading books together as docents um, in a museum and it's such a lovely idea so I'm, I'm honored you chose the slip and I'm so glad that it provided some good conversation too thank you for letting me know that 
Do we have anyone else with comments? Anyone unmuting? I'm curious if um, anyone had heard of the slip or or visited it before um, before this book or before hearing about. Cool. I wanted to mention um I I had only heard of the slip. I happened to go down an Agnes Martin rabbit hole a few months ago, which is what led me to your book. Oh. Um. I hadn't heard of Lenore Taunt. I hadn't heard of any of them. And I did go to art school and, you know, I live in East Hampton. So there were all these little connections to it. And if I had heard of her, it just, I wasn't remembering it. So I don't know. It was just kind of this really interesting timing that you came out with this book at this time that, I don't know, it's just been kind of mind blowing altogether. So I, I, I love when that serendipity happens and, and Agnes Martin rabbit hole is the best rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> awesome. that's, that's a very fun place to be. But I, you know, I also, when I started working on this book, I did not know much about Lenore Tawney at all. I, I had knew, knew a couple of works. Um, she was really one of the real revelations for me. And that's what I also, you know, one of the things that I found to be so, so fun and interesting about this group is that, you know, you do have these really big names, uh, you know, sort of household names from, 20th century art and then lesser known names. But when you start to scratch the surface, you know, they're all there together. They're all in this beginning moment of their career, even as they're different ages and, you know, have different exposure to, you know, different sort of galleries and, and curators and critics and museums. Um, and Lenore Tawney was such a central figure in terms of her support of the artists. She bought a lot of their work. She was really like the only one of them who was um, financially stable. <laughs> Uh, she she came to the slip as a widow and she had inherited some money. And so she was able to, um, you know, to support herself, but also to to buy some work and, and really support the artists. And, you know, you find there's lots of records. She was, you know, quietly paying Indiana's um, lighting bill, <laughs> electric bill um, a lot of the time. So, it, you know, and the, again, these sort of quiet stories of support, I think are kind of rarely told, but of course they make such huge differences in terms of the work surviving, us even, you know, having a certain record of, of certain works um, and also understanding the relationship between, I mean, especially, you know, Martin and, and Tawny, it's something that I, um, there's like a whole chapter really about their relationship and just the incredible affinities between um, some of the work they were making at the same time and, and, you know, what they were being inspired by, as well as the fact that, you know, we, we, we don't know the exact extent of their relationship, but one, what we do know from their letters, even after their time together at the slip was that they were both so keen to make sure that the other was able to be working. So this is like the thing that they were always really protecting, right? And saying, you know, they'd write, how are you doing? And hope everything is great. And like, are you working? Are you able to be working? And I think, you know, that was very moving to me, um, knowing that that can, especially, you know, for Martin, but, you know, just that that can be such a, just having the space and the time and the means to be able to, to make something um is is a real challenge sometimes and you know th that they were both kind of trying to preserve that so much was was very was a very moving narrative that I I did not know before researching the book also I think your your focus on the place itself as a kind of catalyst for we're all in it together that that kind yes. of, and just the very fact well I mean being someone who looks after an artist's place and often people make the connection between the, the location, the environment, the surroundings, and what occurred there. And it humanizes it in a way. And it's really a shame that they can't go down to the slip now and find that atmosphere because it's now a pedestrian mall, basically. It's, yes, it's a little bit different now. There's a CBD dispensary, <laughs> among other A things. little bit, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, some of the artists would probably be happy to know, um, <laughs> but um, yes, no, it's definitely, definitely different, but it's also, you know, but that, you know, part of it is that that change was always there, right? So that is sort of part of the, 
part of the story is that, you know, New York is always changing. And, you know, one thing that um, Jack Youngerman really always insisted with me over the, you know, course of the time that we were um, talking together was, you know, not to, to romanticize this time. <laughs> you know, I think we think, and that he's like, it was really hard, hard work to get these buildings to be livable. And, you know, one of the, I was very lucky that there, there are these really amazing records in, in the form of, you know, most of these artists kept really amazing journals during their time there. So, um, and it is really incredible to, you know, be hearing, well, firsthand from Jack about how he had to, you know, prepare the ceilings and, you know, sand down the ceilings and make the, the place visible, uh, livable. And then there are these notes in Ellsworth Kelly's journals about how many weeks it took him to make his space livable. And then you have Robert Indiana, you know, in his version, you know, talking about that. So it was kind of wonderful to trace these different overlaps of, um, and then Lenore Tawney, it's like, oh my gosh, this place is like terrible. It's so dirty, but I'm just going well, to have to- Well, also, I mean, cold, you know. And that, cold, and yes. And those lofts, they were spacious, but they were freezing in the winter. And just the kind of, uh, I remember Bill de Kooning said, the, pro the problem with, with poverty is that it's so time consuming. You have to spend so much time scrounging for stuff. Yeah. And I think that that gets lost a little bit in the wonderful photographs of them having coffee together and the light is so terrific and the work is all around the space. But just, you know, getting through the day could be a real challenge. And I think yeah. I love the photograph so famous of, of uh, Martin in her in her quilted suit because yeah. she had to have that. Otherwise, she would have frozen. Yeah. No, now absolutely. here I've got a couple comments here. Uh, you'll enjoy this one. Hooray, Prudence! Fantastic presentation of a fantastic book. Thank you for all your work, your research, your writing, your ideas intertwined. I also appreciate that you included photographs of the people and their works, as well as the places and spaces and all the maps. Just a satisfying new vision of a particular place, time, and cultural development. Thank you! Exclamation point. And I echo that. And Susan Leventon wants to know, are you working on another book now? <laughs> oh, my husband's not on this call. <laughs> I can say yes. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> um, I, I, um, this, this book was a long time uh, coming. I mean, it took seven years really because I, well, researching and writing, but I was, you know, working full time um, while working, writing this book. And uh, I also had three kids along the way. So it's been, a, it's been not to mention, of course, like the world turned upside down. So um, it was definitely an adventure and. I uh oh, you, you just froze Prudence. Sorry, did I break up? For a bit there. Oh, I'm sorry. So I was the answer saying, was yes. What are, what the answer, is the answer is yes, but <laughs> um, still, still in very early stages. Um, and, uh, but yes, I think. But if my husband were on this call, the answer would be like, oh, no, no. <laughs> well, we won't tell. Of course, your, your mom might spill the beans. That's true. She's on. <laughs> okay. Well, if we have no other comments or questions, I'm going to thank you again. Uh, I will echo Perry Freeman, uh, whose very, very well thought out uh, words are indeed uh, very appropriate. And I urge everyone who has not read the book to read it. It is absolutely fascinating. And I thank you again for being with us and thank all of you. And I hope you'll be back next spring when Art in Focus will continue. So good evening, everyone. And thanks again. Thank you so much for coming.